Overwatch has been out for four years and counting, and since that time has undergone massive changes, with some of the most radical actually being in the last year. If you're looking to be a returning player or a new player, much of this might be a mystery to you, and especially if you're a current player, it's nice to either reflect on the current state of the game, how far it's come, or to realize things about it that you otherwise didn't. I was inspired to make this video because based upon the viewing metrics of Overwatch as a game, you might conclude that it's in an unhealthy spot, but oddly enough, from where I'm sitting, Overwatch is possibly in the strongest position it's been in years in terms of quality of the product. And there's a good chance that that actually reaches its peak point next year due to how the combinations of the dev team's efforts have compounded over time. In today's video, we're going to take a look at Overwatch from all angles, from the casual perspective to the hardcore. If you're a player that's interested in playing a little or a lot, we're going to evaluate the state of Overwatch as a product currently, but also look to the future to things that have been hinted in store for this game franchise. So we're going to start looking at the trifecta of features that have had a very interesting compounding effect of value to the player to make for what I would say is the most fun gameplay loop Overwatch has seen so far. And that is the combo of Roll Queue, the Overwatch Workshop, and While You Wait. Some of these seem self-explanatory, but what it does for the gameplay experience is massive. So obviously Roll Queue is great. I think just about everybody has heard the positive effects of that, but one of the negative byproducts is longer queue times if players choose to select the most popular role. To solve this problem, the devs have instituted the While You Wait feature, which allows you to play arcade or custom game modes while waiting for your competitive or quick play queue. And to supplement that, the community has made use of the workshop feature in probably its most practical way yet. You see, when the workshop first came out, there was a lot of experimental game modes, let's say, that didn't really feel like they found momentum in the community. But now there's a culture that if you choose to either solo queue playing damage or even playing in a larger group, which typically has a longer queue time as well, you no longer have to tab out and start playing Hearthstone and are allowed to stay engaged in the game with the workshop game modes that have been tailor fit for this drop in, drop out play style. There's a variety of these different modes, whether they be aim trainers or Genji dash practice, just these quick, short, fun mini games games that allow you to experience some of the Overwatch wackiness while you head on to the more serious gameplay in either quick play or competitive. What a lot of these modes have in common is that because they're so friendly to drop in and drop out, you're not really playing to win, you're playing to experience the mechanic of the mini game. As I try to learn how to play the Genji Dash game, you realize that it is actually honing your speed of target selection to chain multiple dashes together and to try to manage and juggle your enemies like you would in a real match anyway. While of course being killable in one hit, which let's face it, that's the reality of playing Genji, isn't it? Tiny Overwatch is a massive triumph for Cap casual play, as it's a super powered version of Mystery Heroes with no real win condition, just ability spam allowing for crazy Overwatch moments to constantly happen. You can consider this mode a Reddit clip simulator. If you're looking for something more serious, headshot only snipers can train your flick shots. And I did actually notice this helped me quite a bit going into playing quick play on Widowmaker. Of course, my favorite mode in the entire game will always be gun game or hero gauntlet. Not appreciated enough in my opinion. I think it's absolutely the best, but there's also other wacky modes like 12 hogs, one hole, which isn't just a funny rule 34 joke. It also is a pretty wacky little game mode that shows off the workshop's ability to modify the hero abilities allowing you to do a cute little jump with your take a breather and removing your ability to shoot, so it's all about the hooks. There's many more of these, and I bring these up because I think no matter what, you can find a mode that's right for you because there are so many available. And I wanted to highlight this because I think it's probably the least publicized improvement to Overwatch, how the development team have tried to take a careful look at the gameplay loop of Overwatch. And this isn't more so the queuing and setting up phase. It's a much more pleasurable experience to do so because there's so many options for you to continue playing while waiting in line to get the experience you want. The other major improvement to the gameplay problems of Overwatch, I think, was definitively said with the most recent balance patch, which you could dub the new state of the game to be the breakable barriers variant of Overwatch. In fact, that was the name of a recent tier three tournament. It's not had the fanfare that I think it deserves. And in short, what it's done to the 
gameplay is allow for Overwatch to play like a shooter with crazy hero abilities rather than you feeling punished to try to play a shooter alongside the hero abilities. I take the huge step in order to allow for skill shots to have openings again to be a signal from the dev team that they too did not like the insane barrier spam that the game had grown to and have moved Overwatch into a firm direction to be a shooter game again. There's new things for high level players to complain about, of course, whether it be Orisa Halts or Immortality Filled from Batiste, but no matter what, there's going to be wacky MOBA cooldowns that are super powerful in the metagame, but I think we should expect that out of Overwatch anyway, but at least now, whether it's at the highest level of play or even in the average ranked experience, you're going to feel that individuals can find value and there are big shooter plays to be made. In the past year, it was possible for defense to outweigh offense in the game, and now it's the other way around, where you have to look to actively set up plays rather than respond to the enemy and survive longer than they can. That's no longer how Overwatch works, and I just want to respect that the devs have finally given us the type of gameplay we've been looking for. Again, tweaking very specific balance is something that's always going to occur, and no matter what, something is going to be obnoxious and overpowered to some degree. But what I find to be a good step forward from the team is essentially communicating to the player base that they're listening and want to improve gameplay. And I would say the gameplay aspect of things is in the best state it's been in a year or two. Like, I can't remember. Feels like a long time. Skill is back. Interactive gameplay is back. And as long as we can keep that core, Overwatch will always be fun to play, in my opinion. Another unsung hero about Overwatch is how well it's optimized. Even when the PC game starts to get a little sluggish, the dev team have done a pretty good job of optimizing that, but one that I was pretty surprised about, the Switch version got huge optimization buffs. I just tried it again recently and was blown away. I originally said that I wouldn't suggest playing the Switch in docked mode because it just wasn't optimized well for it, but with patches and improvements, it now runs great on Switch. It's at the level of performance that I hoped it was going to be at at launch. It took them a bit of time to tweak it up, but now it's fully a great way to play Overwatch, either in handheld or in docked mode. And I can say the same thing for PC, where as they add more and more stuff onto the game, it's going to get bogged down a little bit, but they routinely clean that up and keep the game running pretty darn smoothly. There's always going to be small problems, things to complain about, bugs and stuff, but that is with any game. And I would have to say on this front that Blizzard is keeping up their reputation for being one of the best in the industry at keeping their games well optimized. Now, thus far in the video, we've discussed things that are affecting Overwatch right now. Before Overwatch 2 even comes out, We'll talk about that as well, but just the base game of Overwatch is likely to get more refined down this line. Reason being, there was a recent leak regarding what patch the Overwatch League would be playing on, indicating that there would be a new balance patch in January next year, which you would assume is intended to be in time for the Overwatch League to go live in February. So we can expect hopefully more impactful tuning to the already positive FPS focused gameplay that we have now, and perhaps a new hero. Jeff has indicated in interviews that there will be at least one more hero for Overwatch 1 before the sequel comes out, with a big package of heroes, but I'm actually more excited for there to be less heroes. It's possible that for the casual player, trying out new heroes and how it changes the game is the basic reason to return to Overwatch, but as a hardcore player myself, I'm more excited to see the balance really get into its stride with a more static roster of characters. Reason being, whenever there's a new hero added to the game, if the hero's any good and shakes up the meta, they're probably overpowered and really causes for the entire game to be re-examined. Every time they add a new element, it's so much harder to balance the game, whereas now, since we've had a long amount of time only with the new hero Sigma, skipping over the hero we would have expected to come out in BlizzCon, the balance has been able to get to a much more ideal state than I think it otherwise would have been when they keep adding new crazy additions. So to that degree, we may not have shiny new toys to play with, but instead I'm looking forward to possibly the most stable playing experience for the hardcore players that we've seen perhaps ever. And with that being said, it brings us to the final section of the video talking about the future of Overwatch. I think most gamers didn't feel like the sequel announcement was as impactful as a sequel could be, but I think the more you dig into it, 
the more you realize how much the dev team actually has planned for the sequel and how much they probably were holding back at this most recent BlizzCon. There's a lot more in it that I think people don't realize is on the table to be changing up, which we can tell because of hints that Jeff Kaplan and the development team have snuck into interviews. The thing is, Blizzard developers are heavily media trained in that they don't reveal things they don't want to reveal, but they also leave pretty crucial breadcrumbs to their thought process so that if you piece it together, they basically spell out exactly what they're intending to do without explicitly saying it. Let me give you some examples. Jeff has hinted in a few different instances to fundamental changes to the game of Overwatch, but hasn't ever explained what that is. Just that it's on the table to be re-examined. One of the biggest talking points for the hardcore point of view is that the game doesn't incentivize strategical diversity as much as the high level players would like it to. Swapping heroes and counter stratting makes more sense in a more chaotic solo queue environment, but at the higher tiers, it's much easier for the game to be solved because of how well you can optimize team play dynamics in Overwatch. But also, there's fundamental problems with the ultimate economy, which creates a driving force in the top tier meta to find a team comp that reliably works in most situations. So instead of high level gameplay consisting of countering the enemy, instead, the incentive is to find a team comp that isn't countered easily so that you don't have to swap off and lose your ultimate. With this being a very clear problem, either in the GOATS era or really any era of Overwatch metagame, the community has looked to other games and how they deal with these issues in order to try to emulate that. The first one would be Hero Bands, and Jeff Kaplan has indicated that limitations to some degree may be a route that they go down in order to incentivize strategical diversity. But the thing that I want to try to open the community's eyes to to the way that Blizzard solves problems is that they think in a much more creative roundabout way instead of just strictly emulating other ideas to try to redesign solutions to the actual problem rather than taking shortcut answers. And I don't think bans are a shortcut answer. Obviously, I've advocated for it a ton, but the types of things I think are more likely to come is something that I mentioned in a recent podcast with my friend SVB as we interviewed the now retired pro player, soon to be Overwatch League caster, Jake, where we discussed the fundamental problems of Ultimate Economy. You see, one cool thing about the control game type in Overwatch is that because once you win a round, you have to fully reset, it's the type of game mode that is more fun to play, for one, but also that harsh reset gives you the opportunity to apply a new type of team comp from the start and is typically why you see the most team comp variety on King of the Hill or Control as it's called in Overwatch. An idea that we came to in that discussion that possibly could fix the problem of Ultimate Economy being so huge and a big deterrent to swapping heroes in competitive play is if ultimates reset on checkpoints or payload or 2CP once an objective is capped. If ultimates were cleared out on both teams, it would be an opportunity for both teams to consider swapping heroes to fit that stage of the map. The reason why that doesn't happen currently is because it's more economical to play a team comp that fits sort of best at all three stages of a payload, for example, getting more ultimates rather than ever sacrificing an ult or multiple to try to fit a comp to a specific area of the map. Resetting ults might feel terrible because you lose something you feel you gained, but in the competitive context, it would free up the ability for strategical diversity in a massive way because a lot of payload maps are designed to have vastly different engagement types based on the map geometry. Typically, Streets phase has huge high ground, whereas point A might be a bit tighter, and point C typically turns into a 2CP-esque defenders back against the wall type engagement. And the way the game's currently played anyway is that it's better to use a team comp that is best at all three of these sections rather than tailor fitting a strategy to each section. This is why ult reset on checkpoint would make the game play more like King of the Hill does where each section is treated individually because there's no other option. It's not like you can snowball from checkpoint to checkpoint. It's not possible. Instead on checkpoint battles for the defense rather than holding your ultimates until third, which is much easier to defend and a better use of those resources, you would be heavily 
incentivized to attempt to make heroic plays onto the last team fight of a checkpoint, which makes for much more interesting gameplay. In Overwatch, we want to see more things get attempted rather than a overly safe economical route, which just leads us down the path of least resistance to a more or less standard six player meta. It's this problem of ultimates that makes it so that no matter what the balance is, no matter how good the balance is, if a team comp is like 0.01% better than another one, you probably should run it most of the time just to get the economy value that ultimates provide. They're so powerful that you have to play this way at the highest levels. So I bring this up and explain it, not because I think this is the sole thing that could save Overwatch or if it's even what the developers are considering, but I think it's the type of fundamental change that is on the table for Overwatch 2. At the moment, I think most gamers see Overwatch 2 as a story mode expansion, but when you start to add in the types of things that they could be doing to tune up Overwatch in every way, not just graphically and, and adding new modes and maps, but fundamentally to the gameplay, more alongside dealing with this ult economy issue or even in the live version of the game with the breakable barriers patch, that type of stuff can make you really excited for what's on the horizon for Overwatch. There's obvious things that we can expect with Overwatch 2, like a lot of new heroes, I think is safe to say. Game Informer released an article saying that there was a handful that were definitely coming to Overwatch when the sequel drops. Based on piecing together the hints from all over the place, I would say it's at a minimum, you can expect five new heroes to drop when the sequel comes, but I wouldn't even be surprised if it was closer to 10. The dev team have been speaking about stockpiling heroes for quite some time, and depending on when the game comes out, we can expect quite a impactful drop of content during that time. The release date is still up for question. There were leaks from the dev studio, which spoiled most of the BlizzCon announcements, and in them also stated that the dev team was intending to release Overwatch 2 ASAP in 2020, but at BlizzCon, Jeff Kaplan said that they'll probably be talking about it at next year's BlizzCon, indicating maybe 2021. Based on the information that we've pieced together, I think the dev team have essentially said without saying that Overwatch 2 is looking to be a next-gen console release game. They haven't said that, but they've made a big deal about being able to play the sequel alongside the original, which doesn't sound like a big improvement for those of us playing on PC, where there is just a single platform all the time. But I think that as a selling point sounds much more exciting when you're talking about cross-generation play. This year's BlizzCon announcement didn't feel as impactful because Jeff was speaking about a problem we don't have yet. Everybody's got the same consoles, so playing across the game doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but once the new consoles come out, combining those player bases will be a big deal and make it a lot easier to upgrade into the new generation. And typically during that time, there's not many things to play and Overwatch will be there to satisfy both player bases. And when you start to think about all the things that Overwatch 2 will inherit from Overwatch 1, going back to the start of the video with Roll Queue, While You Wait, Workshop, all compounding together, it'll be exciting to see what else compounds together when all the single player and co-op features are added in as well, as well as any other features that we can expect on the horizon. The workshop, for example, was something that was asked about during the launch of the game, asking for a map editor or use map settings style system. At launch, they said it was a long way out and quietly in the background when most of the players weren't asking about it or thinking it could ever come, boom, workshop just dropped on us. In the same way with the sequel, I could foresee Overwatch 2 look to build up its community features such as clans, team queues, in-game tournaments, and the like, which is something that I've been asking for for years at this point. Because if we're talking about playing across different console generations, having a more MMO co-op experience, those see bigger value when that gameplay grind is available. I remember at the launch of Overwatch's life, the lack of that community feel was often criticized for those who were used to playing Team Fortress 2, which didn't have many of the automated queuing features that Overwatch launched with and instead was much more about selecting servers that you went into with its own rule sets and small sub-communities. Well, now Overwatch kind of has the best of both worlds with that, where between the workshop while you wait and the game browser, we're already starting to get that sense of community back 
And when you think about any lessons that the dev team could learn from Destiny being with Blizzard for some time, or of course with their many years of success with World of Warcraft. Because of that, I think community features is a obvious addition to be coming with Overwatch 2. And if we look back to the timetable they gave us with the workshop or a map editor style feature with that, it lines up with the statements they've made about how much work a clan system battle net wide would take and how important that is to them because that's the thing that i think will really solidify overwatch's ability to maintain interest among players for the long haul ways to incentivize it being more of a social game either playing with the co-op features new ranked modes or the competitive multiplayer i think that's a pretty obvious end game and what i'm using to fill in the blank when so long ago the dev team have described social features being something they're looking to crawl walk and run into the run aspect of that is the next up on the horizon probably obvious for the sequel's launch so that's everything going on in the world of overwatch as i see it in my estimation the quality of the product that is available today is quite above the numbers that you're going to see on twitch or other viewing metrics and because of that i think within enough time that will get rectified the game's in too good of a state and headed in a better direction that players eventually will catch on i'm confident in that as well as the many exciting things that are coming around the corner so if you're excited for all of that heading up into the new year and beyond be sure to leave the video a like it really does help us out and lets us know that you're enjoying the content and if you haven't already be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you actually get notified when our videos go live link to the description is our twitter where we tweet out news updates and dank memes that's been it for me i've been frito for your overwatch we'll see you guys next time